Christianity is about the joy of coloring. And yet there are so many people that will try to tell you that faith is about staying in the lines. But Jesus, I think, gives us a different picture. A way of living that is about coloring. It is about joy. It is about the abundance of life. And today we're going to be exploring about what it means to be a part of community. And we're going to continue that conversation for a number of weeks. So I want to invite you to join your voices in a song of praise. If you are able and like, go ahead and stand. Good morning, everybody. You guys doing okay? Let's go to God in prayer. God, it feels as if as the music has started, as the people have gathered, that we are, we are stepping into your story. 
And we pray, God, that as we continue this conversation, as we allow the Spirit to move us, as we gather around the table, that we find ourselves more deeply entwined in that wonderful story of life and hope and joy and love. Continue to be a part of all we do this morning. We're offering these words in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I invite you to give a quick wave to those around you. Go ahead and be seated. Some things I want to lift up. First of all, if you are a guest, if you are a visitor with us this morning, we want to say welcome. It is a joy to have you here. Cypress Creek Christian Church is a community that strives to put love first in almost everything. Now, we strive to put love in all things. And that's where it becomes a real challenge as we step outside of these doors. So hopefully what we do here together better prepares us for that good work beyond these walls. Next Sunday, it's Mother's Day. But it is also a one-service Sunday because it is Youth Sunday. And instead of having the youth try to run between spaces, we thought it made a whole lot more sense just to do one service. So one service, 1025 across the way in the center. So next Sunday, how many services? One. What time? And point to where it is. You got it. Okay. I want to quickly remind you that we are continuing to sell raffle tickets for the 50th. Every penny from those raffle tickets goes to support new church development. And look at that. Paula's got some right there. Don't buy them right now, but you can find her immediately after the service and do that. And then this morning, I just want to lift up something here. I can pick it up. Uh, this will be a tent. Uh, the Sunday school class I teach, parents of littles and middles is often what we use to describe that class. Uh, they brought some money together and purchased two tents, some sleeping bags. They have also have, have gone into their own closets and dug out some sleeping bags that are still in good shape to donate to the Hope Center of Houston. They're looking for tents. They're looking for sleeping bags. So uh, in the weeks ahead, if you happen to be uh, digging through a closet and finding a sleeping bag or two that you don't use anymore, bring it on up here and we'll make sure it gets to the Hope Center. Our own John Basil volunteers there and does a lot of good work, and he already promised that he would get this tent and the other one that's in the other worship space there along with the sleeping bags as they come in. There's John. I figured he was probably in the space here this morning. You can get new ones as well. Absolutely. We will not complain about that. Well, off and on over the next six weeks, because again, next Sunday being you Sunday, we'll kind of step away from this theme. But we are going to be looking at part one and part two, which is actually the Gospel of Luke and the companion book, which is Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. In this series called The Making of a Movement. And we're going to be reflecting on what it means to be community. And how these two volumes, shall we call them, how they shape community. The story of Jesus in the gospel and the story of the early church in the book of Acts. So today I want to look at Luke 24. And look at some words that come after the Easter story, the resurrection of Jesus, where there are two guys walking down the street on their way to a town called Emmaus, and they run into Jesus, but they don't recognize this person as the resurrected Jesus. Finally, and I'll pick it up in verse 28, they get to this point. When they came to Emmaus, Jesus, who they had not yet recognized, acted as if he was going on ahead of them. And the two men urged him, saying, Stay with us, it's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So Jesus went with them and stayed with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but then he disappeared. 
The two men said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered there together. And then the eleven and their companions were saying to each other, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Simon. Then the two from Emmaus described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. Was made known to them as he broke the bread. You join me in prayer? Break open these words, O Lord, and reveal your message about the, about the Jesus life. Break open these words and allow them to feed us. Amen. I want to invite any of our young disciples who would like to go with Mariah to children's time to do so at this time. My first year in graduate school, I also worked as the youth minister at First Christian Church of Mishawaka, Indiana, northern part of Indiana. I would leave after classes on Friday, take the three-hour drive or so up to Mishawaka, arriving there usually about 6, 6.30 in the evening, staying until Monday afternoon when I'd drive back down to Indianapolis for more classes that were always Tuesday through Friday. But there was one particular week where I wanted to hit the road early because that Friday night there was a youth lock-in. And I wanted to get there early, get my feet on the ground, prep myself, make sure everything's ready, make sure the pizza was ordered, all of that kind of stuff. And so I was glad that I was able to get out of my last class early, start the drive, and I got up there about 2.30 in the afternoon. I went back to the church library, which sat on the back of the building, right at the corner, and I started working. And I got a lot done. And about 6 o'clock, and the youth weren't supposed to get there until about 8. About 6 o'clock, I'm thinking to myself, I got this together. I think we're ready to go. And I'm sitting on this couch, and it's been a long day with classes, driving, and I got a lock in. I think, you know, if I could just close my eyes for like 20 minutes, what a gift that would be. And so I turned off the lights in the library, and there was this wonderful couch up against the wall, and I stretched out on it, and I closed my eyes. And at just the point that I was falling asleep, there was this sound. Now, that sound doesn't describe it. No. There was this bang! And it not only literally shook the room, it literally threw me off the couch. Come to find out what had happened was that a neighbor had left his big pickup truck idling in his driveway. And somehow it either got into neutral or first gear without anybody in the driver's seat. And it went out of his driveway, across the street, down an embankment where I think it picked up some speed, across the church parking lot, and wham, right into the wall of the church, where just on the other side was this couch where I was sleeping. It didn't come through the wall, but it caused a lot of damage to the outside of the wall, and there was enough of an impact that it moved the couch and threw me. I tell you, it was a strange phone call a few minutes later to the chair of the church board. Yeah, yeah, this is Bruce, and I, I, I'm, I'm calling to report that the church was just hit by a truck. Yeah, the church was hit by a truck. I returned to Indianapolis that Monday, and I told my roommates what had happened. And it was Mike who said... Maybe the church needs a good wake-up call like that, because you know that there are some people that are dozing off that don't need to be dozing off. Now, I am not suggesting that God puts a pickup truck into gear and smashes it into church buildings to make a point. That is not what I am saying. But it sort of became a metaphor that I enjoy. Where is God trying to shake us from our contentment? Where is God trying to shake us from that sense of, oh, whatever? Where are we dozing off and missing out on what we should not be missing out on? And God is trying to wake us up. 
In the making of a movement, Luke and Acts, the Gospel of Luke and Acts, written by the same person, they seem intent on, or the author seems intent on building this new community called the church. And building it on something more than a slogan, more than a membership card, more than a well-composed document of beliefs, but on something very different. When Jesus first started his ministry, he did not hand out a copy of the organizational bylaws of this new movement. He did not ask everybody to raise their right hand and to make a pledge. No, in Luke 4, after Jesus had previously been baptized and the Spirit had come upon him, and then he'd had a quick time out in the desert, Jesus walks into a synagogue where he gave a message based upon the prophet Isaiah. I don't know if we'll see that up there on the screen or not. There it is. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, is what Jesus said, because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is saying with those words, right at the beginning of his ministry, right after being filled with the Holy Spirit, this is who I am. This is what I do as one who has been filled with the Spirit. And then we turn from the book where we found the birth of Jesus, the Gospel of Luke, to the, the book that has the birth of the church, which is the book of Acts. And what do we find? Right there at the beginning, the Spirit of God coming upon a people, descending and filling them, not so that they could better memorize the nine fundamental beliefs of the Jesus movement, but so that they could do exactly what Jesus did. So that they could say the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. Because the Spirit has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. The Spirit has sent us to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What does it mean to be a Jesus follower? It's not something that you can easily draft in a document. Yet within a few hundred years of Jesus, the church created its first creedal document, the Nicene Creed. A statement all about what one must believe, and not one word on what the church was supposed to do. Let that soak in for a moment. In 300 years, this movement experienced a dramatic shift from being a religion of practice to a religion of doctrine. From a religion that claimed an enfleshing of the living word to a religion that spent so much time fighting over words. Here's where I'm going with this. At least I think that's where I'm going with this. I'm guessing if I was to ask you all this morning, how many people thought having a relationship with God or having a relationship with Jesus was important to being a Christian? Now, we might define what a relationship looks like a little differently, but I think probably a majority of folks would say there needs to be some sort of relationship. But a relationship can never be healthy and alive if it's nothing more than a list of attributes and ideas. If someone is using a dating website and never gets past reading the profiles and yet believes that they're dating that person, that's that's kind of creepy. <laughs> My wife and I did not meet on a dating website. But had we, I imagine that in her profile she would have included that she has green eyes. And I would have read that and thought, oh, I like green eyes. But it wasn't until I looked into those green eyes. That was something different. I could have read about it in the profile. But when I was looking, there was something magical. There was something wonderful in that moment. 
There is something more than having a list of attributes and ideas that a group of guys argued over and fought over 1,700 years ago. Here is where the metaphorical truck is slamming into the side of the church, shaking many who have dozed off, shaking those who have become rather comfortable in knowing what some third or fourth century theologian thought would make for a good Jesus profile, but never actually went out on a date with Jesus, never actually fell in love with Jesus, never felt a desire to bind oneself to Jesus, never actually came face to face with Jesus. In the story that I read earlier of the two folks walking on the road to Emmaus, met Jesus but didn't recognize him as Jesus. They come to that place in the road, Jesus starts going down one way, and they say, no, 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 Jesus, come with us. Come with us, and, and he does. The two men did exactly what they should have done as people of faith. They demonstrated hospitality, which was central to the Jewish faith and will become central to the Christian faith. And it was because they showed hospitality, this stranger, who was Jesus, came into their home, sat at their table, and that's where they witnessed Jesus taking the bread, blessing the bread, breaking the bread, and giving it to them. Which is what we reference at the table every single Sunday. But for those two who walked with Jesus but didn't know him as Jesus, what they probably would have heard in that moment was what happened when Jesus fell, fed the multitude. Because there he took a few loaves of bread, some fish, and he broke the bread. He took it, he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it. In that moment at the table, Jesus was more than a profile, more than a, a doctrinal description. He suddenly became very real to them. It was this merging of the act of hospitality, of welcoming the stranger into the household, and the reenactment of a story of generosity, where Jesus gave in abundance. It was then, it was then the Jesus, who had always been walking with them on that road to Emmaus, but unnoticed, suddenly became real to them. Bang! They were awakened. They saw. They saw him. Mark started visiting my church in Florida after being invited, though church was entirely new for Mark. He had dabbled in religion here and there over the years, but church wasn't his thing. And so one Sunday, when I thought I had preached a pretty good sermon, here came Mark down the aisle at the end of the service to not only join the church, but to give his heart to God and to seek baptism. And I was thrilled. And after the service, people came forward, including a guy by the name of Reader Miller, who was central to that church. And he shook Mark's hand and said, Oh, it's great to have you come. I bet you came forward because of Bruce's sermon. And Mark kind of looked over at me. And I could tell he was searching for words. He said, No offense, Bruce. You preach good sermons. And they kind of helped me think. But he said it was the people. The moment I walked into this place, they welcomed me. That very first Sunday, they invited me to the communion table, even when I did not even know what it was. I was allowed to participate, and you all's work with the Immokalee farm workers and fighting for justice, you all are doing amazing work there. You all introduced me to Jesus, and I've fallen in love with him. And then he looked back at me and said, I'm sorry, no offense. The sermon was still okay, but it was the community. And Reader kind of stood back and said, wow, imagine that. It wasn't the preacher. And then he kind of looked at me with a grin and said, why are we paying you? <laughs> Reader told that story over and over again for the next few years because it was like, bam. Something hit him that that preacher up there that was just giving you kind of an idea a basic idea of who this Jesus was You know know these three things that kind of stuff, but that's not what really changes a heart 
It's when people live out the gospel. It's when people are embodying the good news. It's where people are demonstrating an unconditional love. And they walk into that and they've never felt it before. And it touches their heart. And they can't walk away from it. It is the merging together. Because I loved what Mark said. I was welcomed to the communion table even before I knew what it was. And you allowed me to be a part of it. I often say that our creed here at Cypress Creek Christian Church is not written with words. It is embodied in a table. It's not something I can put into words. But a little later in the service, you will be invited to participate, to share in that creed. And it's not just for this space, it's for us to learn what that means so that wherever we might be coming across that stranger, we can show some hospitality. And I almost guarantee you that when we do, we will discover the Jesus who is always there, walking alongside us. And my hope and prayer is the person that you showed hospitality to will also have his or her eyes open. And they too will see Jesus. Join me in prayer. God of hospitality and, and generosity, you meet us in the stories of Jesus through the gift of your spirit and in the beauty of creation and through the work of your church. Keep us looking for you and not simply for a better written description of you. Provide us opportunities to meet your living presence at work in the world and an embodied vision of what you are calling us to be about. So often in life, we do not recognize your presence, that, that kind and, and gracious way that you are, and yet it's there, walking alongside us. So this morning, I simply give you thanks for those moments, even when we're not recognizing you, how you stay with us. And in those moments, when we do recognize, May there be joy. May there be a witness. May there be for others an invitation to come and to experience your presence as well. Holy God, your spirit came upon Jesus. And he suddenly talked about what he was called to do. And that spirit came upon a, a group that became the church. And today we are one part of that larger body. And may that, is, may that spirit call us to a life, to a witness, in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you join voices, the song about the Holy Spirit, I hope that you will think about that spirit, not simply dwelling on some guy 2,000 years ago, but that spirit coming upon you in a new and fresh way, dwelling in your heart, reminding who it is that you have been called to be. Because the world out there doesn't need somebody who can lecture them on the finer points of what some theologians said about Christology. What they need is somebody who will embody love who will follow them in their time of need, who will walk alongside them. That's the moment where we go, oh yeah, there's Jesus. There he is. Not the one that the theologians tried to describe. No, there he is in a way that I can't even put to words. If you're able, I invite you to stand.
week we come to this table and sometimes I listen to Bruce's sermon and it really hits me that this is where I meet Jesus this is where I get filled with the spirit and I hope it's that way for you all too today we're going to uh, come forward and get the chalice cups and we will all take together. So when you pick up your cup, take it back to your seat. And then after everyone has been has received theirs, we will go back to our seat and take together. So let us go to God in prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, you are always with us. Yet so often we don't recognize you. We know that Christ walks by our side but we do not know when his presence will be revealed to our eyes. Today we learned about two men who recognized him at a table. This table and this meal are the rituals at the core of our tradition. This is a place to come looking for Jesus to reveal himself. As we partake in this routine of communion, help us to be intentional in our own search for you. Help us to take deliberate action to seek out the living Jesus this morning and throughout our journey. We know that the time will come when his presence will be revealed, and we want to be prepared. As is our custom, we close with the words of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On that night before he was betrayed, Jesus sat at a table with his disciples. And during the meal, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them all and said take eat from this all of you this represents my body that will be broken in a like manner he took the cup and after giving thanks he gave it to them and said drink all of you this represents the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and the many for the forgiveness of sins each time we come together we are told to do this in remembrance of him
as you finish your communion, I want to share with you a few announcements. Uh, number one, Bruce already brought up. How many services next week? One. What time? And where? Awesome. You guys have it. We also have a chorale concert tonight in the Centrum at 7.30 p.m. I hope you will come. I know Joel is putting on a wonderful concert. They have been working really hard, and I know it's going to be great. Peyton has a concert at do -Si do There he is. I bought my tickets, and I'm, I'm anxious to be there and, and hear you perform. So I hope all of you will be able to join us as well. Now is the time where Bruce brought up a couple things in his sermon. A follower of Jesus and being filled with the Spirit. I think that's what we as members do here. So I invite you, if you are looking for a church home that is filled with the Spirit and wanting to follow Jesus in all that we do, I invite you to come forward during this next song and become a member, or you can meet me at the back. You guys sing this song so well with us. Would you stand and do that? Gracious God, may you love. 